Oliver, and I work for an uh, IT consultancy by the name of Go Data Driven, and they specialize on, on data analytics and data science. And we also started working on a blockchain uh, because we realize it's going to have a massive impact on business models. We want to be there first. So we started exploring what can you do with a blockchain. And therefore, I will give a presentation today about how to build blockchain-driven applications. And I just want to step you through the, the three stages of, uh, of blockchain and what kind of impacts it can have. Like on the way left-hand side, what we see f happening so far is that there are all these cryptocurrencies, but I don't want to go into detail about that today. That's uh, not the focus here. I uh, really want to talk about the business models and what kind of potential there is with the blockchain and what's, what could even happen in the, in, the, in, the, in the third stage, which is a bit of a utopy, is that we have our private ecosystems where people have their own blockchains and interact with each other. But that's way far away. So we're going to focus on the business models. And yeah, I just want to give you this, this very classical view of what, a, what the traditional business model looks like versus a platform business. Um, so what you see over here is that the traditional, traditional businesses like GM and GE, they're way asset heavy, right? They have a lot of physical stuff standing around and um, they have a little bit of a platform but not so much so far. And it is changing over time. Um, and also depending on the company, of course, some have a more mixed uh, kind of model where they have a few assets, uh, for example, Amazon and Apple, and some of them are really asset light. They don't have a lot. It's mainly a platform and their, their potential lays in, their, in the brain power of the employees, for example. Um, but there's another option, which is the blockchain business. And that is an, a company that operates and manages a blockchain and actually doesn't uh, do much else beside that. And that could be, for example, an insurance company, that could be uh, broker services, that could be regulation, that could be agents. Um, so those are different, uh, th that's a new kind of business model that we see evolving. It is not quite there yet, but we are starting early, we invest early in the in, uh, in researching it and finding out about it. And I want to step with you through today um, of, uh, through a case study, which I did myself. Um, but yeah, what I hear so far a lot is that people say, oh, it is a technology looking for a problem, right? Well, and I say no. Um, on the left-hand side, you see the, yeah, uh, a schema of how the blockchain works I'm not going to go into detail there, but what it actually solves is just a double standing problem. So whenever someone has a virtual asset, he cannot sell it twice to someone else. That's all it does. And on the other side, we have uh, business running businesses, and for them, it's really far apart uh, through their day-to-day -day problems. It's really hard to see what what are the potentials with the blockchain. How can we use it? And what does this double spending problem mean for us? Um, but there are actually so many applications with it. Um, we can have medical applications, we can do transfers, we can do fraud restriction, uh, rights management, identity. Uh, the spectrum is really, really wide, but it's sometimes hard to see uh, what, are, what are the applications and how to, how to bridge this gap. Um, but all of, all of these applications, they have something in common. And that is that they, they build up trust because between the unknown parties. Um, so uh, every, every business has some trust issues with some of their suppliers maybe or with some of their customers. And the, the key part is to overcome these trust issues and, and uh, find the right technology. And that is the blockchain in this case. And also, there's another shift happening in society, which um, a lot of us see. For example, there was this big Facebook case in front of the Senate just a few weeks back, 
where they were discussing the transparency basically of Facebook and uh, what that means is that people really get aware of, of uh, data privacy, of transparency, people start thinking about it and this impacts business in a way uh, that transparency expectations are rising. And what I put out here is an example company, it's called Ecosia, and they're a competitor of Google. So they're a search engine, and what they do is that they publish the, the financial records, all their data into detail, uh, what they do with the data, uh, just publicly available. You can go online and see their complete finance sheet and where the money is going. And they are having a, a major success with it. So for me as a consumer, uh, if there's a company offering a same service or a similar service of similar quality but has complete transparency and tell me what they do with my data, well, I really like that, right? And that's what we want to do in our case study. Uh, and the case study is about a platform called Instruct. Instruct is a learning platform. and Anyone can join the platform, sign up and create technical challenges about any kind of topic. So for example, you see there's maybe something on Git, maybe something on Kubernetes, and anyone can create these challenges and anyone can come and join these plat challenges. So it's really about uh, learning, and it's a social impact here. And well, what does it have to do with a blockchain? The idea is that Instruct is basically a content distributor. For example, like any other content distributor platform like YouTube, people create content and it might take a lot of time so you expect some reward for it and YouTube for example comes to their content creators and gives them some kind of reward, they, they pay them out money. But the, as a content creator I don't actually know how much money YouTube made and how much do I get from that cut. So I don't know how big is the cut of YouTube. And well, for me, that would be really interesting to know. So the idea is if we use a blockchain for Instruct and people who access and pay for challenges, this money goes directly uh, to the content creators. So the content creators have full transparency about how much is, uh, how much, uh, yeah, how big is the popularity on their tracks, how much are people accessing, how much are people paying for it, and that is done through a blockchain. And Instruct, uh, the business model of Instruct can look like they get maybe a cut from, from that for hosting the services. And yeah, I want to go a bit into detail of how to actually build this application. How can we store data in the blockchain because it's not as trivial as I thought it would be. Um, and yeah, the first angle we take is to build smart contracts. So, uh, smart contracts have the advantage that there are some functions which are automatically executed whenever there's a certain trigger. Uh, with these smart contracts, um, we can create functions for our different uh, for our different players in the system. Um, and there are different platforms which come to mind. Uh, there's a really popular one called Ethereum. Uh, Ethereum runs in, a, in its own VM that has the advantage. It's complete, uh, fully Turing complete, so you can execute any kind of functions. Uh, there are other platforms like Stellar, which is really hot right now. It's, uh, I think, based on Ripple. Uh, there's Neo, which is uh, called uh, the China, the Chinese Ethereum because it's quite similar, but you can actually build stuff in, in Python there. So you can create smart contracts in Python. Uh, maybe also quite interesting. And there are a few more like Cardano and Hyperledger Fabric. Hyperledger Fabric is uh, really uh, designed for, for big applications, for big companies, and it's backed up by big companies. But we chose to go with Ethereum because it's proven secure, it, it's proven that it works, there's mathematical proof behind it, and that just sounds really good. And yeah, well then the question is what kind of smart contracts do we need to build up this uh, platform, to build up this uh, Instruct platform on the blockchain? 
well, of course, we want to we want to be able to uh, manage our tracks as content creators. Those are the technical challenges. So we go, we need functions to add, we move them, maybe to set prices and also declare ownership. We need to have a function to purchase these tracks. And we also be, need to manage our token that is underlying. And yeah, with these tokens, we need a few more functions to have, uh, to transfer them, to see the balances, and also to send approvals. What it actually means for Solidity, I will explain in a, in a second. Um, working Solidity is a programming language to create these smart contracts. So it's uh, a bit like Java. Um, these uh, smart contracts are compiled and they're executed in the Ethereum virtual machine. Um, but working with Solidity is not completely trivial because data storage is uh, not that easy. For example, when we want to work with maps, and maps are really the common way to go into data storage there, you can't actually iterate them, so you always need to keep an, uh, you always need to keep an array with the keys. And that is because Solidity, uh, in, in Solidity, there are th theoretically already all keys available. We just need to know which keys to look for. There's, uh, there's more to it. Um, arrays need to be managed manually, so we need to increase the size, we need to decrease the size. It reminds me a bit more of working with C, where you need to actually create, uh, create a storage. Um, what's also important is that we don't want to be able to send transfers to contracts, because any player in the, in the, in the smart contracts, uh, so for you as a user, or for, for actually just the smart contracts as a function, they all have a, a, a hash key as an address. And if we send tokens or money to a contract, then it would be lost, because we can never be, we will never be able to retrieve it. Yeah, and here's just a few more details on the data storage. Uh, it really looks like a, like a Java structure, where we just uh, create addresses, we create uh, the structure, it has an address, it has a price, and we keep this list pointer. And we uh, do that because it's stored on a map. So we have a mapping of integers to our structure. And then we also have a list keeping track of our keys. So, and now if we want to add a track, we just uh, take the key and add uh, data to it. And that is really trivial. But if you want to remove something, it's, it's a bit more complicated uh, because we don't actually remove the data. We just remove the key pointing to it. So data is actually never, never removed. And that means we need to juggle around the keys until uh, that key is out of our pointer list. Um, a few more details on working with the arrays. We always need to increase uh, the arrays in length if we want to add data to it. And we always need to decrease it in length if we want to remove something from it. So it's unfortunately not as simple as working with Python, where you just add something to it. Uh, but those are just uh, the technical boundaries here. Um, there are a few standards which are really important when working with Ethereum. One is called ERC20. It's like the, the standard structure of any any good contract. It just defines a few functions. And there's also ERC223, also really important. That one ensures that you can't send tokens to a contract, and basically that the tokens will never be lost. And there's also ERC, uh, another one which makes the tokens tangible. Yeah, now if we pack it all together, I, um, this is uh, from a similar project, um, but basically we containerize our application and use it together with Nginx. We have a, a front end and we have uh, a database sitting to it. We compile the smart contracts and then we execute them in our own private test network. We don't start deploying on a, on a public Ethereum network because that costs money. 
and of course we first want to be sure that it works so we start testing it locally and I just want to give you an impression of how does it look like when, it, when it's actually running. So here on the right hand side you see our containerized application running and here on the left hand side you see the browser where, which starts with Metamask. Metamask is uh, the uh, it's an extension to your browser where you can manage your accounts on Ethereum. And you see right now here I'm on the Ethereum mainnet. I'm going to switch to my local host as soon as the application is running. Um, there we go. And now we switch tabs to my application, to the Instruct track platform. And you see there are already a few tracks available. And yeah, right now we have a few functions where we can add a track, we set a price for it. It doesn't look very fancy yet. I'm not a front end developer, I'm sorry for that. And you see, we always have to approve any transaction that we make. And when that happens, you see the, the transaction uh, hash appearing in our application. So the data is actually sitting on a blockchain already. Uh, that is fully functional. We can buy some tracks. Uh, we can also remove the tracks. And yeah, if we increase the window a bit here, did fit on before, we actually see our account balance with our account hash key. So that's uh, the interaction you, we have there so far. And that this all can be wrapped up as an API. And then we can just hook it up to the Instruct platform as it works today. And that is really neat. So those, are, those were the functions we have so far. Um, there's another Kai study I made, uh, which is more hypothetically, but I thought it's a nice uh, thinking experience, which is how could we build a Taos Bazaar that actually works on a platform that works as a decentralized app without actually having Taos Bazaar in between you as a client and the restaurants. Well, what, we, what do we need for that? We need a contract for our restaurants where our contracts have uh, probably a name, they have an owner, uh, they need to have a menu, and every menu needs to be uh, also managed through a, a mapping where you have uh, maybe a price for every menu item. We also need to have a contract for our users where uh, the user has an address well, that is open for debate. It's uh, just an initial idea of mine, but yeah, it's not clear if you want to have the, adver uh, the, the address publicly visible because everyone could see uh, this data. And then we need a contract to, to make orders. Uh, we just uh, order to a restaurant the item we want to order. And then there's an interesting aspect, which is that with our smart contracts, we can, we can design them in such a way that, for example, whenever the restaurant delivers the food and the user con confirms the delivery, that whenever that happens, the, the money for the ordered item is transferred or maybe it is transferred before and then we can have a dispute whenever the food doesn't arrive. So there are different kind of options we can have um, depending on how much user interaction do we want to have how easy do we want to make the system? Um, but yeah, one question, don't we need Taos Besorgt anymore? Well, we still need Taos Besorgt because they're really working heavily to onboard clients to get people in their, in their system. They're really, they're really aggressive on marketing. Uh, you always see uh, these uh, campaigns and ad campaigns from them. Um, and what's also really important is that they solve disputes. So whenever you don't get your food, who are you going to call? You can't call a black blockchain, so there still needs to be someone to take care of that. So what, what happens next? Um, we want to move away from the cryptocurrencies because I think that gives a really bad reputation to the whole technology that you have thousands of these cryptocurrencies and most of them are frauds. Or at least a few um, and it goes up and down so that's also really emotional and we want to move more towards the business models and find the real value within the application and 
this potential that is uh, lying behind there is really individual to some extent because everyone has different transactions in their in their company so the question is what are your valuable transactions where do you need to ensure trust with your clients or with any other stakeholders there's also another key potential which is lying in the supply chain um, or whenever you want to work together with partners that you need to have maybe several people on board to enable this blockchain potential and there are just a few barriers lying behind that so far which uh, are in the technology that technology is not perfect so far when you work with Ethereum you still have transaction costs but that's gonna change soon and might become really uh, really cheap uh, there are also organizational and governance barriers uh, I heard once that blockchain is 90% uh, governance and organization and the, the other 50% are technical issues and there's also acceptance in society which still needs to be developed and just a final word for me uh, as you as you see as I said before I'm working for GoData Driven we're hiring massively but if you're more interested in building on Ethereum you can also go to the Instruct platform to the learning platform and there are Ethereum trucks available uh, so you can go there and play them and uh, learn everything about Ethereum. Thank you very much.